It is inspiring to see so many people filling our auditorium on this cold Wednesday evening, but I'm sure you're all here for the very right reasons. It goes without saying that our city, our country, are going through difficult times, and this is especially true in the world of not-for-profits. But I'd make the case, I'd argue, that it is in troubled times like these that a history museum can make its largest contribution. It has been said that history is to society as memory is for an individual. Without memory, the individual is cut off from whom he is and where he's been. By providing context for what's happening in the present times, a connection with what's happened before, our institution, any institution, can serve the larger purpose. All of our supporters, like those of you who are with us this evening, are both beneficiaries of this purpose, but I would add as well enablers in that without your generosity, without your support, we could not present such a rich set of programs to, to provide that larger context. As you know, at our society's gala last October, Robert Caro received a 2008 annual History Makers Award. It was a fabulous evening. It would be superfluous now to recite Bob's background and accomplishments, not to mention it would take most of the evening. To sum up very simply, he spent the last 40 years grappling with the stories of two enormously complicated individuals. Robert Moses and Lyndon Baines Johnson. In doing so, he has won every major honor and award in nonfiction writing. So far, so good. When I think of Bob Caro going to work every day in his small office, dressed in a jacket and tie, even though no one else will be there, or spending months in other cities on the trail of his subjects, or hour on hour interviewing more than a thousand people who knew these individuals, or sitting in archives day after day, the vision, the thought that comes to mind is the biblical tale of Jacob wrestling with the angel to receive the blessing. Let me explain. I picture Bob wrestling with Robert Moses and now LBJ in order to pry from them the blessing of truth and understanding. I see him trying to pin these giants to the ground so as to uncover who they really were, what drove them, what made them do what they did. The goal of all of this wrestling, the goal of all of this work, the light motif as I see it, is to understand how power works in practice. This is an especially important idea because with all the universities we have, all the great scholars of history, political science and the like, we really don't have much scholarship on the pure, raw use of power for good or ill. It isn't always for ill. Power can be used for the good. Power may be touched on in an abstract way, but before Caro, there hadn't been much about how power actually has been exercised in the political process. 
So in my mind, Robert Caro's greatest contribution may not just be what a great storyteller he is, and he is, what an indefatigable researcher he is, and he is. But as years go by, other scholars and historians will pursue the study of political power in comparable ways. And they'll come to see biography in this same light. The Robert Moses story is especially intriguing on this account because Moses was never elected to anything. The only figure that comes to mind in this respect is J. Edgar Hoover, who also never ran for office, but also nonetheless acquired and exercised enormous power. Bob is honoring us this year by giving three special talks, of which this is the first. He's entitled tonight's talk, The Mark of Robert Moses. It will last about an hour. Afterwards, we'll have question and a question and answer period, followed by a reception and a book signing in our great hall. And now, as they say, let us get to the main event, Robert Caro. Roger, when you introduced me at the History Makers Gala, I said that that was one of the nicest introductions I had ever had. It was so nice that it made me think of something that Lyndon Johnson used to say whenever he got an especially nice introduction. This one was even better, Roger, so I'll thank you in the same way. When Lyndon Johnson got an especially nice introduction, he used to say that he wished his parents had been alive to uh, hear it because his father would have loved it and his mother would have believed it. <laughs> These are three talks that I call the Shapers of New York. When I was working on The Power Broker when I was young, the book was published 35 years ago now, uh, I realized that there were really three titanic figures in it. Not just Robert Moses, but Alfred E. Smith and Fiorello LaGuardia. And they had very different, conflicting visions of what New York ought to be. And in a way, I came to realize it was the conflict between these visions that shaped the city we live in today, as is the fact that the winner in that conflict was Robert Moses. Talking about it tonight, to introduce these three lectures, I'm going to talk about some things I haven't often talked about in the 35 years since The Power Broker was published. But I'm also going to talk about one episode I have talked about before and intend to go on talking about because I want people to remember it. What do I mean when I say Robert Moses shaped New York? Well, one way of looking at it is just to think of what you're going to see the next time you're returning to New York from a trip. If you fly into LaGuardia, if you're coming in on the approach route from the northeast from Connecticut, you're going to fly over the uh, Throgs Neck Bridge, which Robert Moses built, then the Bronx White Stone Bridge, which Robert Moses built, then the Triborough Bridge, which Robert Moses built. The plane will turn around over the Henry Hudson Bridge, which Robert Moses built before coming into LaGuardia. If you come in from the south, you're going to come over the great, pass over the great Verrazano Bridge, then the Cross Bay Boulevard Bridge, and the Marine Parkway Bridge. As you come in, you will see the grid pattern of New York streets. But cutting across it are these straight, thick, gray lines. There's 627 miles of those lines. Those are the expressways and parkways. Robert Moses built 627 miles of them. With the ex single exception of one road, the FDR Drive, Moses built every mo mile of those roads that you see. You'll see the green areas that are parks. Robert Mo when Robert Moses came to power, there were 40,000 acres of parks. He reshaped every one. He added 21,000 acres of parks to the city. He changed the very shape of the city. The city didn't even look from the air uh, in its outlines as the city 